Thank you. Winnie Cowell. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the other legislators and leaders here in the room today for uh, convening this hearing to address these questions. Um, my name is Winnie Gao. I'm the litigation director at the Asian Law Caucus in San Francisco. I'm also the head of its workers' rights project. Um, as some of you may know, the Asian Law Caucus is a nonprofit civil rights organization um, in San Francisco. We have a workers' rights program that provides direct legal services, conducts impact litigation, and does outreach and community education for low-income immigrant workers. The vast majority of the workers that we serve are Asian um, immigrants who are limited English proficient or monolingual in an Asian language. Much of our workers' rights work grows out of our legal counseling clinics. We have semi-monthly free legal counseling clinics for low-income workers um, to come in and ask for legal advice on the full range of workplace problems they may have. Many of um, the folks that we have seen over the years um, have reported um, workplace abuses that um, we see also in the nail salon industry, um, and including many nail salon workers who've come to our clinic. Um, some of the workplace abuses that they've reported um, echo and um, um, uh, are similar to those reported in the New York Times articles. We have found that the nail salon industry, like many other low-wage worker industries, um, are in, is an industry where wage theft is unfortunately widespread and um, underreported. Based on our window into the industry, many nail salon workers are not being paid the minimum wage or overtime. Instead, many are being paid a flat daily rate of as little as $45 a day, no matter the number of overtime hours that they work. Um, they are not receiving proper meal or rest breaks, and instead, many regularly work eight or 10 hours a day, during which they're required to stay in the store at all times in case a customer comes in. Many have had all or parts of their tips taken. Some have been docked amounts from their pay as punishment for dropping a bottle of nail polish or to offset credit card processing fees. Some are also unlawfully made to pay for or supply the nail polish, gel tips, or other work supplies that they use. These kinds of wage and hour abuses obviously have a devastating impact on these workers' ability uh, to pay the rent, put food on their table, support their families. It also takes a toll on their health and well-being. We've helped um, many nail salon workers file administrative wage and hour claims with the Labor Commissioner's Office to address these violations. Um, we also recently brought and settled a class action case against a chain of nail salons in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. Um, those workers were facing many of the kind of wage and hour abuses I just described, in addition to unlawful discriminatory restrictions barring them from speaking Vietnamese in the workplace. But for every claim that we've helped workers file, there are obviously many, many more that go unaddressed. Um, I, we think that a huge hurdle to addressing these workplace abuses, as has been mentioned by other leaders in this room, is that many workers do not know what their rights are and are scared to pursue any legal claim. Many are unfamiliar with the legal system, and as Assemblywoman Nguyen mentioned, um, they are intimidated by government agencies. Um, there are language barriers to access those government agencies. Um, they're scared that if they file a claim, they'll get fired or blacklisted by future employers. We are actually very lucky and very grateful to have a labor commissioner's office currently that recognizes these problems and has worked hard with organizations like mine and other community groups to build collaborations um, to build enforcement efforts together. Um, our organizations are trusted and have a long history in the marginalized com immigrant communities that we serve um, and are able to help with the outreach um, to these marginalized workers. We can do the outreach in the language um, that they speak, um, refer them to the Labor Commissioner's Office, and reassure and support workers through that unfamiliar and intimidating legal process. But I suppose one of the biggest recommendations I have today is that the Labor Commissioner's Office needs more resources to do this job. <laughs> Every year, they're given more laws to enforce, but little resources to do it. They need more money and resources to hire bilingual staff, including, including Vietnamese speakers, to not only handle the claims that they have, but continue to do the affirmative workplace-wide, industry-specific investigations that we've been talking about. They need the ability and resources to con conduct those affirmative investigations, particularly for sectors like the nail salon industry where workers are scared to come forward. And that affirmative investigation makes all the difference. 
More immediately, there are a number of bills that are currently pending before the legislature that would also make a big difference to nail salon workers. SB 588 is um, one of those. It's an important bill. Um, it's a huge problem, obviously, if workers, even when they are brave enough to come forward and file a claim and win, can't collect the money that they're owed. Um, SB 588 um, allows the labor commissioner to um, pursue or file a lien or levy on the employer's property so that when workers win a judgment, um, it can actually be paid. Um, it's hard to change an industry's practices if an employer doesn't ultimately have to be accountable. AB 970 is also another bill that's before the legislature this cycle. It gives the Labor Commissioner authority when it does do these affirmative workplace-wide investigations to include in its citations violations where the employer has unlawfully made the employees pay for business expenses like the supplies for getting your nails done, the polish or the, um, um, the gel tips and other um, workplace um, 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 expenses. Finally, oh, I'm sorry, do you know whose bill that is? Nazarian. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously SB3, um, increasing the state minimum wage, would help all workers. Thank you so much for um, your consideration of these issues. We look forward to working with you further. Thank you. We're now going to hear directly from um, a community advocate who's going to read a statement from a worker as well, Trang Tran. Um, Trang Tran is here. She's right over here. She's going to be the translator for one of our workers, but I'm... I should have last minute. I'm Tracy Nguyen. I am the campaign organizer at CHA, Community Health for Asian Americans. Thank you for having me. And I'm very excited about this hearing that's happening today. I think it's a very pivotal moment for California. Um, so I'm here to testify on behalf of the nail salon workers that we work with in East Oakland. Uh, we have a core group of leaders who are actively outreaching and communicating to the local nail salon groups, and that's through leadership initiatives, learning about their health and safety, and more recently, around more conversations about their worker rights. Um, in the past, they've worked with PG&E to um, improve, do some um, uh, economic, uh, environmental improvements with the lighting and uh, electrical material, and they've also um, outreached for minimum wage, the local ordinance um, measure FF in Oakland. So many of them are ha have been hesitant to come here today or even testify uh, because or reveal their name in their testimony because there is fear of um, harming the industry as a whole or getting in trouble with their employers. And we believe this is due to cultural barriers. So the Vietnamese community has been in this nail salon industry after their resettlement for over three to four decades. So many of the practices have been passed along for generations through family businesses, um, uh, shared family labor relatives, or just like within the community. So it's become a very insular cultural industry and both workers and owners don't have enough information to question or even think about how to improve the practices that have been solidified for all these decades. So, um, some of, the, some of our workers don't even understand what defines workers' rights. Uh, we've really had to ask many different types of questions to learn about some of the stories. And some of the stories are, um, one worker says, where I worked, there was no real break. I would put my sandwich in my mouth, and before I could finish chewing, I'd, ru I'd get rushed by my boss to finish eating to uh, meet a client. On a busy day, there's no scheduled breaks or lunchtime. Sometimes I come home after nine hours at the shop and I realize I did not eat one bite and I feel fatigue. I had no place to file the complaint and I think nail salon schools should also include worker rights education so I know how to defend myself. For my first job, I asked, I was, I asked how often I get paid and they said twice a month. But the first two times they kept the money and said it's in case I didn't give my two weeks notice. And some places will pay in the beginning because it is considered training, and usually that's for one whole month. There was another salon I worked at when I had to take the day off to take my mom to the doctor, and, but they did not allow it, so I quit. So that's one testimony. And I would just like to say, uh, I think we learned a lot from the successful uh, Healthy Nail Salon program and how the ind industries have improved when both workers and owners receive access to information and resources to better their environment. They get to work together and support each other's health, safety, and rights. And I think uh, moving forward, we should have policies that um, allow the community to educate their own community, as um, Janet said earlier. Um, and we can't just enact changes if the workers 
and owners of the industry aren't prepared. So I think it's a very nuanced issue and that whatever moving forward, um, we should make sure the workers the, the and the owners are at the front of the table um, stating their needs. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to have testimony from, and I hope I'm doing this correctly, to FAM. Is that wrong? Hello, oh. everybody. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Mong Kwa. And um, I will be translating for. Tôi tên Mong Thu Phạm. Tôi là hội viên của Cha. Tôi làm nem 10 năm. Tôi có kinh nghiệm làm nhiều tiệm khác nhau. Hello, my name is Thu Phạm, and I am a volunteer member at. Um, Child Community Health for Asian American, and I've been working in the nail salon industry for over 10 years. What she said is that she also has experience in various locations yeah. in many years. Yeah, thank you. Chủ bao lương, thì cái giờ nào rảnh thì chủ lấy cái hẹn để cho massage tay, chân, dai. Okay. Um, so one experience that um, Kutko has is that when there's a slow time in the nail shop, she, uh, the owner would make a schedule for her to do massages for the customer. Um, and because it was a flat rate daily, um, yeah, it was a flat rate um, wage. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the exact translation. I think she stated that during some time, the owners would usually schedule some out, some time beforehand so she can do massages because that makes extra money for the owner. I, I, yeah, sorry, I feel a little bit intimate right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's why I came. I knew I was going to translate. <laughs> As... Um, I, I, I often get corrected on my Spanish um, as well, so please don't feel don't, intimidated. Don't, don't we, feel intimidated. We, I, I'm sure the senator is very happy that you, in fact, um, are, are translating. So please don't feel intimidated. We're very grateful for it. Yes, we are. Chủ bắt làm quét quét dọn tiệm rồi lau tiệm chùi cầu tiêu. So her boss was tell her to um, clean the shop and clean, sweep the floor, sweep the floor, yeah. uh, clean the, the counters, yeah. clean the bathrooms. Khi mà rảnh rỗi chủ kêu đưa con đi tới trường học rồi tới giờ mà phải mình phải đi rước về cho họ tới tiệm. Con của ai vậy? Con của chủ. Con của chủ. So when there's a Break time or slow, uh, the shop is slow, she would have to take the boss kid to school. She was told to take the boss yeah. kid to Drop them to school, pick yeah. them up. Drop what them. I asked in Vietnamese was that she said, pick up kids and drop off kids. I asked her, whose kids are they? And so it was clarified that it was the owner's kids. So I just want to make sure we knew. Because for money for survival, she um, felt like she has to do it. Uh, có chủ thì uh, um, nhận uh, đưa chết nhưng mà đưa na thay nay thay nay tôi không chịu tôi đòi uh, đúc vào du chu chủ nói là uh, đúc vào du chu với uh, thay nay thay nay để xem tiền giống nhau. There's another experience where she work at a nail shop and the boss um, she take checks for um, for her wage, and they, she would told the boss told her that it, when it's come to tax, they would do 10.99, and she said, "No, I want W2." And the boss said it was the same thing. Yeah. Uh, sau đó chủ nó không chịu đưa đúc vào YouTube, thành thử ra tôi nghĩ việc đi chỗ khác làm. Yeah, when the boss refuses to give her the W2, she um, quit that store. Um, chủ tiền thiếp á, khi mà người khách á, cho thiếp đưa cho chủ chủ không có đưa liền rồi sau vài tiếng sau á chủ đưa mà đưa chỉ có phần nửa thôi. There are different instances where um, she would get tips but the boss would not give uh, notify her right away and later on when she did get notified half of the tip was taken away. Tại vì có một lần á là 
mình cũng nghe được tiếng anh chút chút thì cái người uh, cái người uh, khách đó cho 10 đô thì sau đó cho có 5 đô thôi um, one instant where she could understand english a little bit and she overheard the customer telling her owner that um, i took to ten dollars but later on the boss only give her five dollars did you may i ask a question ông 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 chủ hay bà chủ á có trả thêm cái năm đồng đó riêng không bữa khác hay là chỉ có năm đồng thôi không không I I will I will translate the question không tại vì họ họ thấy họ làm sai rồi nhưng mà họ không có nhận lỗi nên mà mình biết cái đó cái 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 câu hỏi á là nãy cô mới nói á là cô nghe đó là được 10 đồng, và ông chủ ấy chỉ đưa lại cho 5 đồng. Mm -hmm. Có bữa khác đưa lại cái 5 đồng đó không hay không. là chỉ có okay. Không, không có đưa lại. So my my question was that she mentioned that um because she can understand a few words of English, so she heard that she was given $10 tip. Um, an hour later she gets the $5 instead of the actual 10. So my question for her was did the other five was ever given to her later? Because earlier, prior to that comment, what she said was that she usually get half of the tip first in an hour and then the other half later. So I just wanted to clarify which was at which time. So just to make sure that, was it just with hell or was it never given the other half? That's what, and it seems like it was never given the other half. So the owner would keep the other half of the tip. That's what I believe that's been stated. Uh, có nhiều lần em có nói với bà chủ á, khi nào khách nó cho á, thì nói liền để cảm ơn người khách là thanh kiều mm -hmm. nhưng bà nói nhiều lần lắm rồi nó cũng làm hoài cũng là cũng không chịu nói cũng là chặn cái tiền đó lại I've told my boss many times that when a customer give me tips that um, she notified me uh, right away but she didn't do that and um, and, and one of the reasons she wanted to be notified so that she at least can say thank you to the customer is to I mean I would assume is to keep that relationship for her as a client her client so thời gian thì không có nhiều thành tử ra tôi nói tới đây thôi dành cho để dành cho người khác nói there's not a lot of time so I want to save uh, the time for someone else to speak Uh, tôi hẹn lần tới sẽ tiếp tục <cười> I'll see you later on. <cười> uh, tôi tôi rất cảm ơn tất cả mọi người cho tôi cơ hội ngày hôm nay và lắng nghe tôi nói I want to thank you everyone for giving me the time and listen to my stories tôi mong rằng quý hội đoàn giúp đỡ cho ngành neo chủ và thợ có điều kiện để học hỏi và hiểu biết về luật lao động I hope that I, I hope that, you know, first I want to thank the body here today for your concerns, and I hope that you would help us, not only as workers, but also the business, to understand the law and to be able to work together. Để cho ngành nail có thể phát triển và lành mạnh hơn. So that the nail industry can thrive and... Uh, at, it, can it, so that it can advance and mm -hmm. profit. Cảm ơn quý vị rất nhiều. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. First, I, I want to thank you. I um, yeah. There is nothing better than a worker who's willing to stand up and tell her story. So thank you for that. You provide a lot of insight that we wouldn't be able to get if not. So. Would you like me to translate for her? Sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, and on that, I think we're going to open it up to some questions on the labor aspect, if we can just have everybody stay there until we are done with questions on the labor aspect. Um, be, and I'm, I see that you're asking one, Brian, but um, I'm sorry, Assembly Member Dolly. Um, just getting all casual with everybody today. Huh? We're going to do use first names. I know, I know. You can just call me Lorena. Um, it's all good. Just for clarification, maybe um, uh, Victoria because we're all on first name basis. Uh, can you um, remind us what the law says as far as tips and employees? Labor Code Section 351 specifies that the full tip must be given to the worker. If it's taken on a credit card, you cannot charge any processing fee or and take that away from the worker. The full tip is owed to them. Um, I, I haven't heard of any kind of practice where you get half instantly and the half at the end of the day. Um, 
I don't think there's a bright line rule on that, but the rule is they are owed their full tip and there's penalties if you do not give them the full tip. Yeah. May I add to ask to yeah, that? Of course. Can you clarify, because one of the things that might be helpful is um, how long does the employer has to be able to give up that tip? Is it within the day, a day or two? What is What is the requirement? I'd have to check with our experts, but I mean, generally speaking, I think, you know, if they're collecting tips at the end of the day, makes sense. Um, I'd want to check and see if there's something about if it's okay to give it with their check. But in terms of record keeping purposes and just making sure the worker is able to keep track, it just from a practical standpoint, I don't know if it's letter of the law, it makes sense to give it to them that day, I would think. I, I know what makes sense. I, I used to be a waitress. So it depends on the restaurant that I work for. Some would give it to me right before I went home. Some would give it to me the next day, especially if I work the late hours. They can't calculate all that. So it would be great to actually let them know what the law is so then they can say, hey, you, I, I get my tip within two days versus at my paycheck, or that the employer also then knows what they're 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 supposed to do by law as well. And so I think that would be helpful to for clarification because if they have to give it within that day, there's no such thing as you know giving half and half. And I'll be honest, this is the first time I've heard about the half and half of tips. Yeah, me as well. Um, I'll definitely talk to our labor commissioner staff and happy to email the committee and hopefully we can get that out to all the this worker and then as well the other worker groups. And I know there's questions, so we're going to start with um, Assembly Member Dolly and go around. Thank you first for holding this hearing. Thank you for coming in. I'm a business owner, uh, have employees, and they understand their rights. I understand their rights. And I am c totally confused of why these business owners are able to take advantage of the workforce. And um, so is I'm, I'm also my, a business owner sitting right next to me. We'll probably we, We're chatting on the side here. But what is, there a, is it the language barrier? Is it the culture? There's got to be something that I'm missing here. And I know that I picked up on a little bit. I read the article, uh, the, the New York Times article, and I know there's a, that, that they're working their way into the job on some of these cases, but it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They should be paid a decent wage. They should be treated like everybody else gets treated that – is in a normal business, so I don't understand. I, and I want to know what, why we are not enforcing the laws that we already have on the books. Is it the states? We don't have the people that are going out there. Is what, and why aren't they reporting? I can answer, speak to that. I don't know if I can fully answer your question. Um, our labor commissioner's office uh, enforces in a multitude of ways, and two of the primary ones where we've seen enforcement in this industry is both workers bringing complaints through our wage claim process, or what may be known as the Berman process, uh, as well as our field enforcement, where we do targeted inspections based on leads, based on data um, that we collect, tips, et cetera. Uh, where we go in and enforce and ask to look at records and speak to workers. And we do have uh, enforcement staff that are certified in languages other than English, including Vietnamese, um, as well as some of the other languages that affect all aspects of the workforce. Certainly, we would like to get more enforcement staff that um, – <laughs> that do have that language and cultural competency than what we have now. That's something that we've been working on for, for a while and continue to want to do better. Uh, I think some of the other panelists can speak to some of the other reasons, but I think as, um, as the Senator mentioned, there are some, you know, different issues with some of these communities where there is a mistrust of the government and we need to work to get to do outreach. This is a great forum to help with that. Uh, and ensure people what let people know what their rights are, let employers know what their responsibilities are, produce information, get it out there, um, but also help build that that trust so that people do feel like they can come forward.